thousands of years ago in ancient China, a meteorite fell to Earth. A green flame delivered a prophecy. Three times will I flame green, once to bring death, once to bring life, and once to bring power. A lamp maker crafted the meteorite into a lantern. The villagers thought he was a sacrilegious bastard and tried to kill him. The green flame put them all to death, as promised. Years later, the lamp came into the hands of a deranged mental patient, who took the lantern and gave it a more modern shape. In gratitude, the lantern restored the man's sanity and gifted him a new life. Then in 1940, after already delivering two-thirds of the prophecy, the lantern fell into the hands of Alan Scott, a railroad engineer. Following a bridge collapse, the flame told Scott to fashion a ring from its metal, giving him fantastic powers. Scott delivered himself a new persona, that of the Green Lantern, and with the ring... An untold power delivered justice as part of the JSA, the All-Star Squadron, and more. Ladies and gentlemen, when you talk about Green Lantern, you've got to talk about the original, the one and only, Alan Scott. Now, all the way back to 1940, there would not be a Green Lantern today if not for the original. Now... Everybody knows about Hal Jordan. We talked about him. Everybody knows about Kyle Rayner, Guy Gardner, a lot of other Green Lanterns out there. Now, the original Green Lantern was not part of the well-known Green Lantern core. No, his ring came from an entirely different source, had altogether different powers, altogether different weaknesses. But this is where the idea started. And Alan Scott, still around today in various forms... Uh, sometimes he's from an alternate dimension. In some versions, he's the same guy from the 1940s who's just been kept magically young through various means and shenanigans. But always one of my favorite characters. I'm a huge fan of legacy characters. And when it comes to legacy characters, you don't get any more with it than Alan Scott. I mean, he was the original. He was one of the original characters in what would come to be known as the iconic DC lineup. Before there even was a DC Comics. Uh, what we know now as DC Comics was originally a loose affiliation of separate publishers that put out their own superhero comic books and occasionally would come together and show each other's characters in one big book. And so you'd have things like Justice Society and, and whatnot. And eventually a lot of those companies just kind of merged and became what we now know as DC Comics. So Alan Scott was one of those original superheroes. Before there even was a DC Universe, he was part of it. So always a lot of fun to talk about him. And surprisingly, not a huge number of action figures that go into this character. And that's a real shame. Because again without him you wouldn't have so much of what we have today. But continuing what we have already been talking about. Got my hands on the first ever DC Direct Alan Scott action figure. This is one I've been waiting years and years and years to get my hands on. But in addition to that we're going to jump ahead a full 10 years. And we're going to take a look at. Mattel's DC Universe Classics Alan Scott Green Lantern action figure. That's right, we're going to be taking a look at a little bit of the old, a little bit of the new-ish. We're going to see how each of them holds up and how well they represent one of the most iconic characters in the entire history of DC. Alan Scott, the original Green Lantern. So, we're going to look at both of them today, one at a time. First, we're going to look at the original, then we're going to look at the Mattel Really been looking forward to this for a long, long time. Can't tell you how much. As I said, to start with, we're going to look at this guy. So we're going to come back in just a minute. So, the original Green Lantern, Alan Scott, first showed up in All-American Comics number 16 back in 1940. 
And this isn't his first appearance action figure. I do have that one from DC Direct, but I couldn't find it in time for the video. It's in the vault somewhere. A lot of things are in the vault. Uh, I was able to get this one recently, and that's why we're talking about it specifically. But this is a great representation of how Green Lantern looked during that original run from 1940 to 1951 when the character was, for all intents and purposes, retired at that time. Um, the Hal Jordan Green Lantern would be introduced later in 1959, and that's when it was established that this Green Lantern uh, was part of a completely alternate universe, parallel Earth, if you will. But yeah, this was the original character to go by the name and wield the power ring, or at least a power ring. It had completely different powers and completely different source of power than the Hal Jordan and likewise the Green Lantern core power rings. There's been a lot of different and conflicting explanations for why that is. There's even been a few attempts over the years to try and tie Alan Scott's powers into the Green Lantern core uh, through various retcons and things, but yeah, no, originally there was no Green Lantern core, so the character had nothing to do with them. Uh, that's, you know, just how comics try and tie everything back into each other, you know, it makes sense why they do it, but it doesn't always work. But, so yeah, this version of the character had a completely different origin, different powers, uh, his ring could read people's minds, it could help him walk through walls and things like that. Um, sometimes it could have him go back in time. It could do a lot of the things that the Green Lantern Corps rings could do, and a few things it couldn't do. Um, the biggest difference being that Alan Scott's ring could protect him from anything except objects made out of wood. And... Once more, many different explanations have been given for that over the years. Um, all conflicting. I I'm not really going to get into it because it would take all day to discuss and parse out the whys and the wherefores. But yeah, that's how it used to work. And one thing that always struck me as odd for a character named Green Lantern was that a surprising amount of his outfit is not green. <laughs> Um, you know, he's got the bright red shirt and the purple cape, and it's a neat look. As I recall, in the comics, the character chose this outfit on purpose because it was very jarring and garish and looked weird. So, like, you know, when bad guys would see him, they'd, before they could process what they were looking at, he'd already kicked their asses. So, uh, I think that was the end continuity reason for it, but it is kind of a weird costume. But I like it all the same. In the 90s, they did a really good modernized version of it that sort of simplified it. And I liked that version too. But this is how he looked generally for most of the history. And definitely the original 1940 to 1951. I really love how DC Direct used to package their figures. I've talked about this. Here, you get a great World War II backdrop with the rest of the Justice Society standing behind green lantern i think that's fantastic i love how they used to do this stuff with dc direct i wish that companies would do this more often with their action figure packaging it just makes sense to me it makes each figure look unique and dynamic and really stand out uh like even if you're an in-package collector and you had a bunch of these old dc directs on your wall or whatever they'd all stand out because each character has its own unique backdrop to it so I really love that, and, you know, I'm definitely going to take them out, but even in the package with the logo and the backdrop, it just looks so, so great. I always keep the box art when I remember anyway, so definitely going to hang on to this one. On the back, you get a little bio of Alan Scott, brief version of what I already told you before, and then a bunch of the other figures available from... DC Direct at the time, as well as specifically the rest of the Justice Society. So you have your Wonder Woman, the original Wonder Woman there, you got Starman, and of course you got to get Dr. Fate in there, and the Spectre. Then you would have pretty much, with the Flash, you got the original Justice Society right there. That's one of my goals, is to have a complete version of the original 
JSA in action figure form. Well, on my way with a couple of these guys, this one was not too tough to find. I think it was about $40 maybe, which is, you know, mid-range. But again, this figure came out in the year 2000. And one of the things, well, probably the thing. You ready for this? This was the very first action figure based on Alan Scott that anybody had ever made. So this right here is a huge piece of history. Nobody had ever done a figure based on Alan Scott until DC Direct did it in the year 2000. So this figure all by itself just for existing is a big deal to me. So as much as it hurts to take it out of the beautiful packaging, I'm definitely going to have to because I want to get a good look at the figure. I want to get a good look at the battery and I want to get a good look at the ring because that's the original that's based on the one from 1940 love it can't wait to get my hands on it we're gonna be back in a minute uh, I'm just gonna look at this one more time before I pop it open and yeah this is uh, already one of my favorites from my DC direct collection been looking for this guy for a long long time so we're gonna come back in just a second I'm just gonna need a minute alone if you don't mind here he is the original Emerald Guardian, Alan Scott, Green Lantern, the one and only. Now, this guy is where the entire mythology started. Dig that sculpting, dig the colors on that costume, totally authentic to the original comic book, right down to the look of the cape, the style of the collar, the mask, even the way the logo is drawn on the chest, it just does not get any more authentic than that. That is some really, really good sculpting and paintwork by DC Direct. This is why you collected those figures. You wanted that authentic comic book look. And especially for a character like Alan Scott that does not get a ton of love in action figure form, this was a huge deal. For the year 2000, this was definitely to standard. We're going to talk about the ups and downs, the good and the bad, but to be completely honest, for the year this thing came out, this was not only acceptable, this would have been a huge, huge deal. This would have been a must-have figure for the year 2000 for any DC collector because this was the first figure based on the guy. Anytime you get somebody's rookie figure, it's a huge deal. I'm actually amazed that it's not harder to find or more expensive than it is. As it is, it's reasonably easy to find, and you can get them in pretty good shape, too, uh, for a reasonable price. I definitely say it's a great addition to anybody's Green Lantern, DC, or Justice Society collection. doesn't get much better or more authentic than the original Green Lantern, Alan Scott. Based on his 1940s look, unbelievable. Can't say enough good stuff. Dig it, dig it, drink it in. We're going to take a little bit more up-close look in a moment, but for now, take a good long look at the original Emerald Gladiator, Alan Scott. All right, so here again we have Alan Scott, Green Lantern, one of the first DC Direct superhero action figures. And the first ever action figure based on this character. Gotta love that, right? So, again, the sculpting and the look and the coloring of the character is completely authentic to how he looked during the 1940s. They changed his look a few times over the years, and there's been a few different versions of the uh, figure. You know, a few different figures have done the character, interpreted it different ways, but this is pretty much down to detail one uh this, this is one to get man this is definitely on point in just about every single way this is what the guy looked like even right down to the fact that he predominantly wore a ring on his left hand so that's a, a thing you know know your history alan scott was uh the left-handed green lantern so he comes with his power battery very cool very authentic look there we've got uh, the hand is actually a little bit rubbery to open the grip to get the lantern in and out so that's pretty cool 
The cape is a little bit malleable, but it's a little bit, it's hard enough to restrict the movement of the figure and it keeps its shape. You can move it a little bit, but it keeps its shape and it is going to hurt the articulation a little bit. The collar is surprisingly stiff and hard as well, but um, yeah, the, the coloring of the purple outside and the green lining is right on point. The colors are really good. That's, that's definitely, and even the way they drew the lantern, that is exactly the way they drew it back then, uh, for sure. The mask used to wrap all the way around. That's how they originally drew it. Very cool. Articulation-wise, again, keep in mind, the year 2000 this was. And so you're going to see limitations, but you're also going to see some cool stuff that shows you how ahead of the game DC Direct was at times. So for the shoulders, you do get the, the up and down, all the way around but you also get a little bit of side to side i wouldn't mess with it too much because the early dc directs have a history of sometimes these these joints wear out pretty fast and they might get loose on you real quick but yeah you can do lateral movement with the shoulders that was a brand new thing back then you almost never saw that you do get the hinge jointed elbows they're slightly limited by the sculpting of the puffy shirt but again, that's the trade-off for authenticity. You don't get any swivel at the wrist. That's a bit of a bummer. You don't get any wrist swivel because that means the hands are stuck in a pre-posed position. Thankfully, the pre-posed position works for the figure. Like, he can hold his lantern up and he can do the fist pose with his ring hand. And, you know, you're not going to need too much out of him posability otherwise but so you know you got the head goes side to side but again it's going to be limited by the cape collar no up and down motion back then you really didn't see that very much in 2000 so you got the one point shoulders two three four five legs go forward but can't they could go back in theory a little bit but the cape's going to get in the way good. six seven pretty good knee joint bend eight nine and you got some ankle rockers going on in 2000 dig that man dig that you almost never got that back then that does kind of assist in the standability of the figure because you can adjust the legs and the ankles now i've got quite a few of these old dc direct figures from 99 2000 2001 you almost never got ankle joints and you definitely didn't used to see them at retail figures either so this was one of those ways that dc direct could be really ahead of their time in a lot of ways and this wasn't even a standard thing among dc direct figures they they only really did it on a few back then but later it became pretty much an across the line thing this is one of the first ones they brought that out on. That is cool. I really dig that. Now, no standing base. A lot of them didn't come with them back then, unfortunately. But you do get the lantern and you get the ring. So the ring, again, is sculpted to look like the lantern. This is a recreation of the very ring that Alan Scott wore. It says one size fits all. Because it kind of has some, it's built to flex. So if you're a husky fella then uh, <laughs> you know or gal husky gal you could uh, still wear the thing and there it is so you got the, a little bit of the old and the new you know i better not keep these on too long because you know that that kind of you know, that's, that's what hal jordan did next thing you know he's, he's uh, blowing up the main battery and, and all that kind of stuff so you know for now it's fine but you know remind me to take one of these off later at least but uh, yeah, for now, it's pretty cool. Uh, I dig that. So yeah, some of the DC Direct figures back then used to come with some pretty cool accessories. Uh, like uh, the Green Lantern figures, a lot of them would come with a battery, a ring, or both. Uh, later ones would come with a stand. This one obviously doesn't. But still a really cool figure. It does stand pretty well on its own. But I would find a stand. Um, this, one, oh, this one doesn't have uh, foot pegs. But... I don't know, a little Dremel might take care of that, or you can even get, like, wire stands to kind of hold them up. It's not that they won't stand, but, you know, if you were going to have any of these on a display for a period of years, there's just a chance that eventually something's going to happen and might uh, try to take a tumble. So, you know, I, I try to get stands if I'm going to put them on display, but 
you know, this one didn't come with one, some of the later ones did, that's awesome, but yeah, I mean, totally, totally, totally awesome figure, by 2000 standards, this would have been an A+, plus. perfectly recreating the original character as he appeared in the original comic books, and you got a little bit better than average articulation for the time as well, definitely a great figure of any era, but Considering when it came out, I gotta put it over huge. This one is a big deal. This one's an A-plus for me. I definitely recommend picking this one up. If you're any kind of Green Lantern fan or Justice Society collector, I mean, Alan Scott is a historic character. You would not have so much of what we have now if not for the original Green Lantern. So, respect to that. And I don't actually have a lot of Alan Scott figures this was one I've been wanting to get for a very long time. I can't tell you how happy I am to finally have them out of the package and in my hands. Totally love everything about it. Again, like a lot of DC Directs, it's a poseable statue, yeah, yeah, yeah. But still, for the year it came out, pretty ahead of its time. Can't deny that. Uh, for all its limitations, it was still better than almost anything you could find back then. And it's the first ever figure of Alan Scott. What else can you say I mean what other reason do you need to go out and pick this guy up this is the rookie figure of one of the most important and iconic characters in the entire DC universe if you don't pick him up I think you're kind of an idiot that's 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 what I think I'm sorry I can't, I can't sugarcoat it uh, definitely you gotta get this guy now were there other Alan Scott figures later on absolutely were there improvements later on absolutely whether it was DC direct themselves or whether it was Mattel come down the line later on, things do evolve, things do get better, and we're going to talk about that in just a minute. Right here we've got the Mattel DC Universe Classics DC 75th Anniversary Alan Scott. And this figure here, 10 years later, we're going to take a look at how things had evolved and moved on after 10 whole years from this to this so just a minute we're gonna come back this guy definitely awesome but we're gonna put him aside for just a minute we're not gonna forget about him we're just gonna put him off to the side we're gonna come back in a moment and we're gonna take a look at this it's a double shot of Alan Scott right here on from the vault check it out so we just got done talking about the original first ever figure of Alan Scott produced by DC Direct back in the year 2000. Now we're going to jump ahead a full 10 years and switch companies. We're looking at Alan Scott Green Lantern as produced by Mattel as part of their DC Universe Classics line in the year 2010. Now, a lot of similarities, a lot of differences, a lot of improvements, not going to lie about that. How does it hold up? Well, I mean, look at it. There's so much more to this figure, even though it is, in some ways, not as accurate to the original comic book version, but in its own way, a little bit more dynamic and, you know, modernized in a way that's still in touch with the original version. We'll talk about what I mean with that. But yeah, this is a really cool looking figure. It's really hard to get him wrong. I mean, you know, his costume is what it is. He looks how he looks. And it is what it is. So, big uh, 75th anniversary packaging. Can't really get around that. Can't ignore this when you're walking by. You see this thing on the shelf. Really jumps out at you. Makes you pay attention. We switch around to the back. We get biography and some statistics about the character himself as well as the cross sell for the rest of this wave of DC Universe Classics action figures from Mattel. Collect all of them. You got the Ultra Humanite Collect and Connect build a figure. As usual, when people go to the Ultra Humanite, they go to the Albino Gorilla. You know, they don't really, they skip over the whole stuff when he was in, uh, in his brain in that actress's body. What's her name? Dolores Winters. Uh, yeah, it was, a, he, Ultra Humanite, you know, he wasn't just the Gorilla. He, 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 his brain was put in a lot of different stuff, but they tend to only focus on that for some reason. I don't know. DC, they, they got a thing for Gorillas, I guess. Uh, but that's a whole other whole other thing it's late we've been we've been doing a lot of these today it's late uh, 
but anyway so yeah definitely uh, some cool packaging because it gives you a good shot of the figure some information about the character itself and it tells you the rest of the line can't really get any more simple or to the point than this i like the background of the package on this with all the other dc characters sort of like a throwback to something like george perez would have done back in the 80s early 90s you know he was notorious he was one of the guys who was famous for doing those spreads where in some form or fashion you get like every single dc character in one splash or spread that was really cool so yeah definitely a great uh thing to pay homage and tribute to the history of dc comics and yeah we're gonna take this guy out of the package and we're gonna show him off and we're gonna see how well not only does it hold up to the original figure but how much it advanced and improved upon the dynamics of that original figure so stick around we're almost there folks we're almost there but we gotta do it we gotta go in depth on these things there's no way we can half-ass it we gotta be thorough we're gonna come back in just a minute we're going to look at this guy and all his majesty, the original Emerald Gladiator, Alan Scott. Hang out for just a minute. There he is, the original Green Lantern, Alan Scott. Gotta love it. Mattel did a great job with this figure. All the little details are there and accentuated, giving a little bit more modern flair in some of the cases. The cowl is a little bit longer the buttons on the rope that attached the cape a little bit bigger than they were back in the 40s biggest difference is a ton of articulation as you can see so 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 much more you can almost not even count all the extra points of articulation that this figure has that the DC direct figure could never hope to achieve it just you know standards were not there yet but this is one heck of a this isn't mine i think i'll throw it out hey that was my window to the world well now it's been shattered by the monster this is a superb representation of alan scott the original green lantern no doubt about it, this is one of the greatest versions ever in action figure form. Some of the details are a little bit off from an authenticity standpoint, but it works in favor of the design of the figure, I would say. We're going to talk about all those little details, but for now, just take a good long look. Drink it all in. One of the most important characters in the history of the DC Universe, the original Emerald Gladiator, Alan Scott. All right, so again, this figure definitely has a lot more posability than the other Alan Scott figure. This is probably the best figure of him that's ever been done as far as that goes. I know not everybody is in love with the head sculpt. A lot of people were not thrilled with the angry yelling face. It's not really one that's associated with Alan Scott, but, you know, it is what it is. I'm not a huge fan of those kind of face sculpts in general. I prefer a more neutral face on a basic action figure. Uh, for If they're going to do variants of a guy... I don't mind it if they do something like, you know, an angry face or a screaming face, but I don't really love it too much on a, a standard figure. It does make them stand out, but... <laughs> Sorry. It does make them stand out, but at the same time, you know, um, it doesn't fit everybody, and I would say it doesn't fit him. Um, but aside from that, everything else, all the little details are pretty good. A lot of them are not as authentic to the original comic book version as the DC Direct was. For example, the cape collar is a little bit longer on this figure than it was in the actual comic books and on the other figure. The color purple is a little bit off. The drawing of the lantern on his chest is not quite as it was back then. The, the lantern itself is sculpted different than how it was in the original comic books. The original belt was brown 
this one is black the green is a deeper green than what was on the original comic books and the straps on his boots are a lot thicker than they were on the original comic books so again these are things that were changed in translating this figure and you know it takes a keen eye to notice you got to be somebody like me who reads way too many comic books but um you know you notice those things but they're not necessarily bad things it's just they're things that stand out if you know what you're looking at and i can say pretty confidently that why they did a lot of them was just to make the figure a little bit more dynamic and modernized like i like that it's a deeper green and i like the longer collar i like the changes that they made it's simply you know if you're looking at what's more authentic then the other figure we looked at would definitely take the nod in that respect that one's definitely got all the little details down to a finer point but this is a fantastic action figure and i think all the changes work i forgot to say the mask right this one's got the uh the robin or nightwing style mask that just sticks on the face where the original version it went all the way around now to be fair when they brought the character back in the 80s and ever since that's what his mask looked like and that's what this figure is probably based on so yeah it's just uh you know it's those little things those little differences they don't really matter in the grand scheme of things, but if you're a person like me, you do notice them. They're not better or worse, they're just different. So I uh, I, I like how close they went uh, as far as, you know, getting the base details down. Uh, I mean, the articulation is through the roof on this figure. Um, you're still limited by the cape a little bit with the side to side on the head but it's still better than the other figure and you get a little bit of up and down as well uh, you get the ball jointed shoulders with some lateral movement as well but you also got the bicep swivel you got the deep hinge elbows you have the hidden wrist articulation which i don't know why they couldn't do that on the dc direct figure so already you've got a ton of articulation on this figure you've got the ab crunch okay. no uh, no waist swivel because of the belt like the whole torso here the lower torso being one sculpted piece so you don't got a waist swivel you got the ab crunch the legs like all uh, dc universe classics figures you can do the splits you got the uh swivel at the thigh you got the deep bend knees you got the ankle rockers okay, so yeah this figure tons more articulation than the dc direct alan scott easily this one because it was in a package so long, a little bit of the packaging rubbed off on the cape i could probably buff that out i'm sure i got some of it off before but yeah if i take like a, a brush to it i could probably fix that no problem But yeah, definitely a lot you can do with this guy. And I'm really happy to finally take a look at this one because I've wanted to talk about DC Universe Classics by Mattel for a very, very long time. And this is the first one we've looked at and it definitely won't be the last because I've been hoarding them and stockpiling them, waiting for a good opportunity. And this opportunity came when I decided to talk about all the generations of Green Lantern going all the way back to the beginning with Alan Scott. So this is a fantastic job by Mattel. One thing they are great at, whether it was DC, whether it's Masters of the Universe, or whether it's WWE right now, one thing Mattel has always been great about is getting the deep cut, deep lore characters, and especially the legacy characters that go back to the very beginning of a brand or a franchise and really doing them justice pun fully intended for this chairman of the justice society alan scott this was definitely a huge get this is a must-have figure for any collector of dc or green lantern gotta love it only accessories it comes with are the battery which again is totally different from how it used to look in the original comics but i like it it's fine i like the metallic green they use on it it's more of a jade really but since it was from china originally i think that kind of works maybe that's why they did that 
Aside from that, you get Ultra Humanite's leg, which means nothing to me for now until I get a bunch of the other figures in the wave. Because that's what you had to do with DC Universe Classics. You had to buy a whole wave and you get a bunch of this crap and then you'd get an extra figure. So that's pretty cool. But it makes getting these guys in the package with the extra parts a little bit expensive if you're trying to find them like I am. But this guy wasn't too bad. Um, you also get a button cool little button of uh, Alan Scott taking on a bad guy pretty cool I mean it's nothing special but it's something it's neat and then on the back it's got the uh, DC 75th anniversary logo there neat little bonus not something I would have asked for but it's cool that they bothered it all I like that I would have rather had another ring if I had my say in anything, but they didn't ask me. And I got I got plenty of rings. It's no big deal. I got plenty of these things. But, uh, you know, it just would have been cool. That's all I'm saying. It would have been nice. They gave us the battery. Could have given us the ring. But, you know, they were over a theme. Every figure in the wave came with one of these silly buttons. So, but yeah, um, this is definitely a must-get figure if you're a Green Lantern fan or any kind of a DC collector. I say definitely hunt this one down and pick it up real quick before we're, we are done for today you know we got to do this because we do both the old and the new we got to look at both of them together and see how they stack up so we'll be back in just a minute to do that before we wrap it up and take it home all right so we're going to look at the dc direct first ever alan scott action figure and the mattel DC Universe Classics Alan Scott action figure, and we're going to take a look at the similarities and the differences. Each of them are better at their own things. Specifically, the original figure is more on point with the comic book accurate details, at least to the 1940s version. The Mattel version, to me, is more of what Alan Scott would have been drawn like after they brought the character back in the 80s and were using him in the 90s before he became Sentinel and they redesigned his outfit. So this is a classic but modernized version of the character, whereas this one is more based on the original, original look. So that's something to keep in mind as you look at each one. So the Mattel one is obviously taller and obviously has a ton more articulation. That's pretty cool. Um, what I like about the DC Direct one is that the cape is wider the Mattel one has more flutter so they each have their plus points but I do like a wider cape at the same time the Mattel one has a larger collar and I really like that as well so again it's like six and one with these kind of things um, as you can see the color on the Mattel figure is more of a grape purple uh, I like the purple better on the DC Direct version, but, you know, it's, uh, it's very similar. Hey, what's the matter, you? Hey, I'll say for me. It's late. We've been up, I know. We've been up for hours doing this. So, anyway, um, the logo drawn a little bit differently. And placed a little differently again more accurate on the DC direct version but fine in either case they both have the ring where it's supposed to be on the left hand that's great the battery more authentic on the DC direct but looks cooler on the Mattel version again basically it's it's a matter of uh, the changes that the DC Universe classics by Mattel have the changes are mostly improvements with the exception of the color of the cape that, that's pretty much what I would say because I like the bigger buttons. I like the rope standing out more um, You know, I like the straps being bigger. I like the two-tone color belt the Mattel belt even has some sculpting to make the belt look like leather, which is really cool I don't know if you can really get a shot of that or not, but it's just an example of uh, really fine detail work on the sculpting of that figure I mean, you got to love that. That is something. You don't really see that too often. A lot of figures have belts like that, but I don't recall too many that actually have line work sculpted in on them. That's really neat. I like the head and face better on the DC Direct. 
but you know it is what it is on the Mattel it's not bad but I agree with people who say that the screaming head doesn't necessarily fit Alan Scott and a lot of people got this figure and they went out and got a replacement head a custom head I've been thinking about doing that I've seen a few that would look really good so kind of on the fence we'll see I might do that with a if I find a loose one of these I might want to put the other head on them because I like to if anything do that I always like to have one that's the same as the factory but sometimes I'll touch one up and make it a little bit more my own in that respect but yeah um obviously the dc direct could never stand up to a mattel as far as the points of articulation or the posability or the sturdiness but you know you gotta credit where credit's due for a figure that came out in the year 2000 this was way above standard and you gotta love it um just the fact that it had as much articulation as it did right down to the ankle rockers and the mattel figures like they did with everything else they seem to take what had already been done and just improved it tenfold. So we go from here, ten years later, we end up here. To me, that's amazing. They're both amazing. I mean, like I said, if you're any kind of a collector or any kind of a Green Lantern fan and you don't have both of these figures, I don't know what the hell's wrong with you. I mean, to have the first ever one and probably the best ever one of one of the most iconic and, and important characters in all of DC history... To me, it's a no-brainer. You gotta get both of these guys. Altogether, having both of them might set you back around 80 bucks, depending on where you find them online. But you know what? Don't make excuses. You know, these are must-have figures. Anybody would be thrilled to have these guys on their shelf. And you can do a little bit more with this one, but this one still looks great. Can't say it doesn't. You're lying to me. So that's about all we could say as far as Alan Scott goes. We talked about the history. We talked about the evolution of the figures themselves and how we started and how it's been going. And you know what? I love it. I love everything about it, man. Hopefully you did too. We're going to talk about more and more and more DC Universe figures going on in the months and years to come. That I can promise you. For now, it's been all about Green Lantern. We're going to talk about something a little different next time. That I can promise but for now, this has been a blast. I hope you enjoyed this look back at some of my favorite DC characters, some of the greatest Green Lanterns of all time, starting with the original up through the 90s. This has been Ricky Rocks, the icon of old school, bringing old school to the new school. That's what it's all about here on From the Vault. I'm having fun. Hopefully you did too. Like it, share it, subscribe to it, hit the bell, do the thing, comment, tell me what you think. Tell me what you love. Tell me what you don't. I'm all about it. We're going to see you next time from the vault. And if it can't be good, be bad, baby.